Our invited speaker for the final block of talks in the conference is Koppel Van Erp. Uh, Koppel received his PhD in 2015 from MIT with a dissertation uh, unifying uh, the treatment of A and A bar movements and exploring the space between them. Although the thesis focuses on the Nilotic the Nilo uh, language Dinka, it bears the, the hallmark of strong theoretical work in being relevant to the treatment of phenomena in different language families, including at least one that is relevant to the current audience, Philippine type voice. Uh, Coppa is currently a lecturer in linguistics at the Queen Mary University of London, where he has continued his strand of research on Austronesian languages. Um, and his work in, on Fijian deals with questions of argument structure and licensing, and more recently has branched out to other oceanic languages with an article to appear in Linguistic Inquiry on Imere, Imere spoken in Vanuatu. Today we will hear about Fijian and what it can tell us about uh, transitivity. Uh, please, uh, welcome, please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you, uh, Anderson. Thank you for, I want to say thank you for the uh, invitation and uh, also um, uh, I want to say a thanks to the organizers for how well uh, all of this has been run. It must be, uh, it's a really challenging task and it, everything's run really well. Uh, also, thank you to everybody who's woken up early to be here. Um, so what I want to talk about today is some facts uh, in Fijian that I've been thinking about for the last couple of years uh, or so. Um, and it's a fair, it's a, it's an intricate and interesting data set, I think, and um, this is kind of my attempt to uh, make sense of it. Uh, in a sense, it's going to be kind of a boring talk because I think that what I'm arguing for hopefully isn't going to be super controversial. Um, I think once we put all the pieces together in the right way, mostly the picture is quite comforting. That something that seems at first glance uh, like it might be a little strange actually is uh, made up out of familiar parts. Um, so um, yeah, and so what I've settled for here is a kind of compromise between a handout and a slide, uh, uh, which I hope works well for for everyone. But there's also a, a normal form, more normally formatted handout on the AFLA website. So what uh, pattern uh, am I uh, talking about? Um, so in a number of oceanic languages, there are at least two sort of types of verbal suffixes. Uh, that I'm going to call uh, following uh, what is also done in the literature, the short suffix, which consists of, typically consists of a consonant followed by E, and also um, one, maybe two types of long suffixes uh, that look like consonant a key, sometimes the K, the K is a glottal stop or consonant uh, a kini. Um, so, uh, and these, these suffix types seem to have different functions and in, in sort of interesting and complex ways. So I've, I've illustrated here with uh, some examples from Fijian, which is what I'm going to be looking at for the root uh, viri, which appears with at least three suffixes of, of this type. Um, so you can see in uh, 1a that this, uh, this root can appear with a short suffix, uh, uh, key, and to add a goal argument, I threw at you. Uh, but this um, same root can also appear with a uh, long suffix taki. The e is deleted here, um, but it's uh, but that's 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 irrelevant. Uh, to introduce a reason object in this case, why did you throw? Um, and you can also have a for this root identical, but for other roots different, and also syntactically different long suffix taki, as in one c. Uh, to introduce the theme, I threw the ball. Um, so there are a couple of, there are sort of two main puzzles associated with these suffixes. The first one is a syntactic one, uh, and so in the in the literature on these suffixes, it's been point out, pointed out that both suffix types, depending on the verb, are associated with uh, both applicative and transitivizing functions, apparently. So the short suffix is most commonly employed to form transitives, but with some verbs, like this throw verb uh, in 1a, it reliably adds a goal or path argument. Um, so it does seem to have a little bit of an applicative function there. Uh, the long suffix uh, usually looks like an applicative in most of its forms, like in 1b, which I'll actually argue is a straightforward applicative as well. But then with some roots, uh, it seems to do something different and add uh, a, a theme argument as with 1c, which we don't typically think 
uh, is associated, uh, comes from an, an applicative type of a function. And we'll also see that this is very lexically restricted. Um, and at the same time, these short and long suffixes don't stack in an obvious way and all attach to bare intransitive roots. Uh, on the morphophonological side, a famous uh, puzzling property of these suffixes is that they all start with this consonant C, which is idiosyncratic and varies by root. Uh, and a long-standing question is whether or not to treat these consonants as part of the root as they sort of historically, uh, they, that they historically derive from, or uh, as part of the suffix with a bunch of allomorphy rules. So those are the two puzzles that I'm going to be looking at, and I'll be doing that through the um, lens of a Fijian case study, um, which is the language I've been working on. Uh, and what I'm going to argue is roughly what's at the top of page two here. Um, so first, uh, based on a variation in these thematic consonants, both across suffixes and across roots, and also uh, some patterns in nonverbal contexts, uh, I'll propose an analysis of the idiosyncratic consonant as a realization of little v, um, uh, as in approaches uh, like Lichtenberg and uh, a dissertation by uh, Karen Ashley, uh, in which these are independent morphemes, uh, sort of analogous to theme vowels in Slavic. Uh, then I'll uh, uh, propose that the uh, short suffix is a transitivity marker with e, the exponent of transitive voice. Um, I'll uh, propose that the long suffix uh, uh, consonant aki has this additional argument introducing apple head uh, ak, um, as so this is this whole thing, this whole picture sort of schematized in two, and that will be the basic picture. So this is in a sense not too controversial because people have uh, recognized the transitive and applicative functions of these suffixes before. Uh, but then one of the other contributions of this talk is I'll be looking in more detail at verbs that depart from this pattern where the short suffix has a more applicative like function and the long suffix seem to, seems to introduce themes. And so I'll identify several subclasses of verbs that are like uh, viri throw. Uh, and on the basis of accompaniment readings that arise with verbs of motion, uh, I'll propose that these verbs, what distinguishes them is that none of them take DP objects directly, but actually a hidden PP small clause, uh, which also can be realized as ak sometimes, and alternations in this uh, small clause structure will give rise to these apparently exceptional patterns. Um, so yeah, so in this proposal, the oceanic uh, pattern uh, in, in the languages that have it can be thought of in terms of familiar syntactic ingredients, uh, even though we seem to have a, a range of different effects going on. Okay, so let me start by looking at the thematic uh, consonants in more detail. Right, so let me introduce this uh, for those of you that may not have uh, looked at this recently uh, or, or before. So a well-known feature of a number of oceanic languages is that uh, many of the verbal suffixes that are used start with an apparently idiosyncratic consonant. So this, uh, was, uh, as far as I, I know, first uh, extensively discussed for Maori. Um, so in Maori, many verbs can surface with a passive suffix consonant ia, which is uh, related to the uh, short suffix that we'll be talking about. Um, um, whose consonant varies arbitrarily. So you see this in three. It has a bunch of other forms, but uh, in one of its forms, it has this arbitrary consonant. So you see for drink, tie, gather, begin, show, they all take this different consonant. Now the historical origin of this consonant is quite clear because uh, Proto-Oceanic permitted these root final consonants. Uh, so the verb uh, drink, for instance, was uh, inum uh, with this final M, but modern Oceanic languages are uh, like Maori are vowel final, so these consonants now surface only when there's something following, like this verbal suffix. Um, now, so as famously discussed first in a, in a review paper and later in a longer paper by Ken Hale, there are at least two plausible ways of approaching these consonants uh, uh, synchronically, um, what he called the uh, morphological or conjugational analysis, in which we take the consonants that have been reanalyzed to be part of the suffix, and treat variation in the consonant as allomorphy. Uh, or we could maintain a phonological analysis uh, in which the consonant is uh, underlyingly still part of the root, but undergoes some rule of deletion whenever it would uh, be in a word final position. 
And so a lot has been written about uh, which of these uh, analyses is, uh, should be preferred. Uh, there's particularly a, a little bit of a literature, uh, phonological literature, uh, focusing on the learnability of the, of the Maori data. Um, but I'm going to uh, present some, uh, some facts from Fijian today uh, that at least for some uh, oceanic languages, the morphological analysis or a version of it uh, has to be correct. Um, arguing for a proposal in which the thematic consonant is a, is a realization of little v building on work by Lichtenberg and Ashley arguing that these are uh, independent morphemes, uh, relying on the idea that uh, little v and voice are separate uh, functional heads. Okay, so before we uh, get into that, a little bit about Fijian and what this pattern looks like in Fijian. Um, so uh, Fijian is a Central Pacific language spoken by about 700,000 people. Um, the data here comes from elicitation sessions with three speakers of standard Fijian who all live in uh, uh, and work in London, uh, and also uh, two field methods classes at uh, Queen Mary with two of the same speakers. Um, so in Fijian, like in Maori, all verbal suffixes contain this initial idiosyncratic uh, consonant. So I'll show you some of the range of variation that you get with uh, what the short suffix consonant E. Um, I sometimes put the E in brackets because it undergoes deletion quite regularly in, in Fijian, but uh, that's uh, something you can uh, ignore. Um, and this short suffix permits the roughly the variation that's given to you here. So you can see uh, to start with in 4a you have two verbs kau and uh, rai and they both take this short suffix uh, when they are transitive. Uh, one of them has a t and one of them has a, 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 a th um, which is written as c in Fijian. Um, and as you can see, you can see the full range of variation that is permitted in table one. So you, as you can see, you can get a range of different consonants, including a uh, null consonant for uh, some of the verbs at the, at the very bottom. Um, and as in uh, Maori, some of these can be uh, reconstructed to Proto-Oceanic. Although you might, uh, although there is a little bit more of a mismatch in Fijian, which uh, uh, if we have time, we can discuss. For example, if you look at the verb for drink in Fijian, you'll notice that it actually has a different, the, even though this is the same root, it actually has a different consonant than in Maori. Okay, so in Fijian two, um, Hale's analytical question arises. And I argue that we should actually think of these thematic consonants as uh, independent morphemes, specifically realizations of little v. So I'll argue for a verb like kauti, bring uh, transitive. Um, I'll argue for a structure like five, where the T is actually a little V morpheme and, and E is an is instantiation of little voice, which I'll argue for later. Uh, note that even though I'm gonna be decomposing these suffixes, both the short suffixes and the long suffix, I'm gonna continue in the glosses to treat them just as one unit. Uh, this is because they, they co-vary together so often anyway, and, and you end up also because of the deletion rule that happens with E, you, there end up just being a lot of null morphemes everywhere all the time. So I think it's far more readable if I gloss them together, but um, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important caveat. So I'm gonna treat variation in this thematic consonant as uh, allomorphy conditioned by the root um, and sometimes also the following suffix as we'll see in more, in more detail. So you can imagine vocabulary insertion rules like in six where uh, little v spells out differently in the context of uh, these different roots. Um, I've given you a sort of elsewhere rule here that maps little v to null that could also be phonologically conditioned. It doesn't really matter. Um, again, if you wanna talk about this in more detail in the question period, I'd be happy to. Um, okay, and yeah, and I've put voice here as part of the conditioning environment, not strictly speaking necessary, but we'll see some evidence that this should be the case, at least for some verbs, that there's actually variation in this regard. But yeah, so the basic idea is these are separate morphemes and uh, you, um, their, form is, 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 their forms are conditioned by allomorphy. So what are some of the arguments for this kind of morpheme-based analysis? So uh, one first bit of evidence is that because there are quite a few different types of verbal suffixes in uh, Fijian, you can compare across them. And unlike in Maori, where it was noted that, uh, where Hale pointed out that actually the same consonant often appears, there's much more variation in Fijian. So there are some roots like uh, the root ngalo, swim, 
which always surfaced with the same thematic consonants. So you see uh, ngalo here across uh, a couple of its different uses with different verbal suffixes. So 7a, 7b, and 7c on the next page are all different suffixes. And you see it always has this v. Uh, this is a pattern that you get with more motion verbs. Um, but there are, at the same time, many verbs that permit variation. Uh, and you can see this in tables two and three uh, later uh, when we discuss the longer suffixes as well. So the verb lua to vomit, for instance, appears with three distinct thematic consonants uh, across uh, three of its uses. So you see this here in A, a through C, lua da, lua raki, lua taka, you get these different uh, uh, consonants. And a morphological analysis captures both of these patterns because you allow uh, for the root alone uh, for swim or the root and suffix together to condition the form of little v. So you can have the uh, thematic consonant vary by uh, the following suffix. Um, another piece of evidence that you want to treat these as separate morphemes comes from the fact that it's not just the root alone that can condition uh, the form uh, of these thematic consonants and the root and suffix together, it's also suffixes alone that sometimes can condition the form of the thematic consonant. So there are some suffixes that are reliably associated with particular thematic consonants. The applicative uh, uh, reason uh, suffix is almost always the form taki uh, with a thematic consonant t, although this is sometimes overwritten by uh, a thematic consonant uh, if it's found with all versions of the root, but it's largely t. There's also an intensity suffix, which is uh, usually of the form laki with an L. Uh, this suffix can be added to a transitive to create an intensity reading. So you see this in 10AB. So you can say something, a plain transitive is erroni slapped me, but you can also use this long suffix laki with the L, sambalaki to mean erroni slapped me repeatedly or uh, in, intently as an intensity kind of reading. Um, and this is almost always, this suffix almost always surfaces with L, but it's not the case that L is part of this uh, suffix because there are there is variation. A small set of verbs uh, surfaces with raki, and there are even completely idiosyncratic cases where you either get the thematic consonant of the short suffix or you just get something completely different. So this was noted by Arms in uh, his, his 1973 paper, uh, and you have, you have this table here in 11 where you can see some of the uh, variation that you get with just this intensity form. Uh, so I think this is quite difficult to capture in a root uh, analysis, but this, uh, or in an analysis where this consonant is part of the following suffix, but this uh, independent morpheme analysis can capture this relatively straightforwardly by allowing for uh, lots of variation in the allomorphy rules. Okay, um, now do we know specifically that we want to treat these as little v heads with this established? So let me present to you one argument for this. There's another argument uh, that I have from patterns of verbalization, which I've put in one of the appendices because it's a little bit more involved, uh, but this one is relatively straightforward. So this argument comes from the formation of adjectives, which in Fijian you uh, productively form through, often through duplication and also through attachment of the suffix uh, consonant a. Uh, um, which so in, in this case, the consonant is actually optional. Um, so, uh, so we can look then, because this consonant is optional, we can look then at roots that can have a short suffix and that can also form an adjective with just a. Ah. Um, so what that should do, uh, if we look at a form like grow, for instance, uh, tumbu, tumburi, uh, which takes this r in the short suffix, if this r was part of the root, uh, when you attach a suffix a ah at the end to form uh, this adjective overgrown, as in 12, um, this should be a perfectly licit phonological environment for this underlying uh, root consonant. Um, but in fact, you can't have these, uh, this uh, thematic consonant appear there. And this is true across these uh, different examples. Whenever you, um, yeah, you never sort of see, you never sort of see this consonant reemerge with these forms. Um, and this fact follow, these facts follow if the consonant is not uh, part of the root anymore, but a little v morpheme, uh, which is going to be absent in these adjectival structures because it's the root is uh, found under a little a head or something like that. Okay. 
All right, so that's the, with that picture of a thematic consonants in, in mind, let me move on to the short and long suffixes. So I'll first provide a basic analysis of the sort of canonical functions of the short and long suffix before moving on to some of the more problematic cases, these verb classes where it seems like the functions are uh, almost reversed. So I'll present some evidence that the uh, short suffix consonant uh, E, or and specifically this E part, uh, also uh, realizes a voice head, um, taking little v and voice to be distinct functional heads. This is an idea that uh, has appeared in uh, a bunch of uh, work uh, in, at AFLA so far. Um, uh, so to show you this, let me show you a little bit about the distribution of the short suffix. So, um, right, so in intransitive, Swedish verbs are, are bare. They can take some different prefixes that don't uh, alter argument structure uh, so much, but, um, well, maybe the reciprocal does a little bit, but are outside are irrelevant to the system. Uh, so you typically get this uh, bisyllabic uh, uh, bare root. To form a transitive, the most common strategy across roots is to add the short suffix. The short suffix can be added both to anergatives, like in 14ab with the root drink, nunu, uh, but also uh, uh, to the large class of unaccusatives. So you see this in 15a and b for uh, uh, kau, which is uh, unaccusative in Fijian uh, in the intransitive form. So you can add, uh, you add the short suffix t. Uh, and as I said before, there's deletion of final e, which always occurs before the third singular clitic a. Um, so whenever this uh, third singular object clitic a is present, you delete e. Um, I'll take, I'm going to take this to be irrelevant uh, um, to the actual identification of the functions of these parts, uh, partially because this doesn't happen in Western Fijian dialects where you always preserve the e. Um, and there's some work uh, for more detail on uh, the distribution of this a, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, there's some more interesting work by uh, Aronovich, and I've also recently wrote a paper on this. Okay, but the main point with this short suffix is that um, its distribution is not conditioned, but it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, types of thematic roles that are present in the sentence. Uh, so you can see this for unergatives and unaccusatives. With unergatives, if you add this short suffix, you add a theme. With uh, unaccusatives, if you add this short suffix, you add an agent. And we can show across a range of environments that this short suffix really only tracks whether there are two full nominal arguments in the clause. And it's not sensitive at all to the specific thematic roles involved. And there are two specific environments in which we can see this very clearly. The first is noun incorporation. So if we take these uh, same verbs, uh, ngunu and kau, and we do a noun incorporation of the object, uh, which in Fijian uh, is usually diagnosable by the so uh, nouns even though they're orthographically uh, usually written separately uh, don't have the article not and uh, this is a noun incorporation structure and they can in fact be followed by some transitive suffixes in other uh, environments of verbal suffixes um, but uh, when you do a uh, noun incorporation in a plain transitive, the short suffix disappears. So munu, which uh, should have the short suffix uh, v in a, in a transitive otherwise, and kau, which should, should have t, no longer have these suffixes. And that follows because these, the short suffix just tracks whether there are two full nominal arguments. It doesn't care about the specific thematic rules, which are the same as in the transitive. Um, another environment in which you can see that this uh, suffix really only tracks the number of nominal arguments and not thematic roles is in the causative. So there's a causative prefix uh, va or vaca, which you uh, can add to intransitives, um, uh, not to transitives, as I'll, uh, as I'll discuss later uh, briefly. So you can add this to the same roots like gunu and kau um, and add a causer. So you're adding a causer on top of an intransitive uh, verb phrase. And, and, in these case, and so in these cases, you once again have two full nominal arguments because now you have this causer as well um, and you get the short suffix again. Um, now the thematic roles now are completely different because uh, you, haven't, you actually don't have the theme that you ordinarily add with uh, V for Munu and you don't have the agent that you ordinarily add with T for uh, Kau. 
So I think this is really clear evidence that the short suffix really only is sensitive to the number of nominal arguments, uh, whether there is more than one, and not the specific thematic configuration that we're dealing with. Okay. So my proposal for this reason is that uh, this short suffix is the realization of a voice head that uh, realizes uh, object agreement in some way, a voice head with a valued uh, phi probe, and that it appears whenever object agreement is successful. Uh, there is a sort of, there are these object clitics in Fijian, which uh, might also be linked to uh, this process. They, they uh, are present whenever, uh, whenever you get um, this uh, short suffix as well. Um, but I'm not taking, crucially, I'm not taking this E to necessarily be the exponent of phi agreement. It's the exponent of the, of the phi head because itself doesn't co-vary with phi features. Um, right, so how does this uh, explain these different patterns? Well, intransitives will generally lack object agreement, so there won't be a short suffix. In unergatives, the phi probe will just fail to find a goal because there won't be anything in its, in its domain. Uh, in unaccusatives, I just propose that this voice layer is absent. Uh, in noun incorporation, the object is going to be reduced uh, for independent reasons and therefore might be ineligible for a phi agreement, uh, as also noted for some uh, noun incorporation languages in, uh, in Baker et al., uh, this 2005 paper. In a causative, there are two DPs, so object agreement is possible, once again. Um, a concrete way of understanding this is to say that the causative structure that's built on top of an intransitive comes with its own voice head and which can establish uh, object agreement. And that can be spelled out with this short suffix. So that's my view of, that's this basic proposal for how to understand the transitive function of the short suffix. Um, now let me move on to uh, one of the uh, uses of the, of the long suffix. This is one of the sort of prototypical uses of the, of the long suffix. Um, so many people have suggested that uh, suffixes of, uh, the long suffixes have an applicative function, and you could see this in Fijian most clearly with a suffix that I'll call reason taki, um, because that's usually its form. Uh, and again, I'm calling it reason taki, even though I'm going to be treating this final e as a separate morpheme, and also this initial t as a separate morpheme. But since they sort of go together, it's, it's useful to talk about it this way. Um, so this reason suffix combines with intransitive verb roots to in introduce a reason argument. Uh, it doesn't have any kind of selectional restriction. You can add it to an unergative like drink in 18a. You drank because of a death, um, where Taki introduces this, this reason for drinking, or an unaccusative like a cure shake in 19b. Um, so my proposal is that this, is, this involves a high applicative head uh, in, that's realized by this uh, morpheme ak uh, in the sense of uh, Pilkinen, uh, which can appear in the extended projection of any root. All right, so that looks something like in uh, in 20, the full sort of uh, proposal for what a verb phrase like 19a is going to look like. Uh, and I'll take the initial consonant of this suffix, this t, to be an allomorph of little v as before, conditioned by this apple head um, because it uh, intervenes between little v and voice, blocking forms that are conditioned by the root and voice uh, jointly. Um, in support of this, there are some verbs with the same consonant across suffixes, uh, so verbs where it should be the root that's determining this, the thematic consonant only, which permit variation uh, just in, in this case. So ngalo to swim, for instance, uh, speakers also, some speakers also permit ngalo vaki to have this same uh, reason meaning. Right. Um, so one, so, if, so uh, for those of you that, uh, so some of you might have a question about this. It's one thing that's strange about this is if taki is indeed a high applicative, it should also be found on transitive verbs, right? Because this is one of the hallmarks of high applicatives in Pilkinen's work. They combine uh, equally with any type of verb phrase, so also with transitive ones. Um, but I think this is actually just a, uh, an independent gap in Fijian. It actually turns out to be the case that uh, across constructions, Fijian never allows more than two DP arguments in the same clause, so that it's just never, it's not possible to add a reason DP to a, a plain transitive. There are a couple of ways in which we see this, um, aside from this restriction on reason uh, taki. 
there are no double object ditransitives. They're never, they're never permitted. Um, they're only uh, DPPP ditransitives. The causative prefix vakava also has the same restriction. Uh, we also already discussed this. It must attach to intransitives. So I'm going to assume that there is a distinctness requirement in the sense of Richard's 2010, uh, something like the um, double O constraint in, in Japanese, which prevents multiple DP objects from co-occurring in um, the same domain, which we can roughly take to be the voice P phase. And a specific piece of evidence for this kind of interpretation is that you can add reason taki to a verb that has an incorporated object. Um, so this is observed by, by Schutz and also uh, Ironovic, for instance. So you see this in 21A and B. If you uh, incorporate um, the object of something like uh, ngunu, uh, so yangona, kava, then you can add this reason suffix, even though you can't otherwise add it to a transitive. And that makes sense because an incorporated noun is not a full DP, and so you satisfy this distinctness requirement. And the same repair is also available for causative constructions where you can do the same thing. Um, note that you could also pursue a case licensing type of analysis for this restriction, where you just say that there isn't a case licensor for a third object. Uh, I think there are reasons why that doesn't work as well. You can ask me about that in the question period, but it's not totally relevant here. Okay, um, right. So I think that that uh, is the only real objection to this being a, uh, to analyzing this as an applicative. Um, another piece of evidence for this being a, a true applicative uh, and not uh, something that introduces a regular uh, object is that um, whenever you try to, um, when you try to do noun incorporation with a reason object, uh, the result is always bad. So, um, you can see this in 22A and B. Those are different attempts to do noun incorporation with a reason object. And as we'll see, there are other long suffixes with which you can do noun incorporation, but not this reason one. Um, and that follows if these are uh, not in complement position, but these are objects in a specifier position. And so they can't undergo uh, noun incorporation head movement in a sort of classic Baker uh, style view. All right, so with that sort of picture in mind, with an analysis of the thematic cons consonants first and a, a sort of basic understanding of what it means to be, uh, 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 what the transitive function of the short suffix translates into and what uh, the distribution of this kind of applicative function of the long suffix might look like in Fijian, I want to turn now to the more problematic patterns, uh, which arise with what I'm going to call the consonant aki suffix, uh, which is a, a another a version of the long suffix that has quite distinct behavior from this talk, reason taki suffix. And so there are a few verb classes where we get this unusual behavior, both of this suffix and of the short suffix. Um, so there, it's been noted that a number of Fijian verbs show this unusual alternation. Uh, and this has actually often been described as a, a pattern in which the function of the long suffix is to introduce a different type of object than the uh, short suffix, which is something that should make us skeptical, right? Because in, in general, suffixes don't uh, necessarily have the function of looking at a different construction and telling you, I'm going to introduce a different type of object. Uh, so what pushed people in this kind of direction? Um, so uh, with a number of verbs, you get a pattern like in 23, 24. Uh, so the short suffix with these uh, verbs introduces a goal or path argument. So you see this here with uh, throw, vidi, and whistle, kalu, where the short suffix ki and uh, vi um, give you a, a goal in this case. I threw at the man, the woman whistled at the man. Uh, and then when you look at the long suffix, which for vidi is taki and for kalu is uh, vaki, um, as in 24a and b, um, you get what looks to be a plain theme. So you get a threw the ball and the man uh, whistled the song. Um, and there are uh, a few classes of verbs that have uh, patterns like this, as, 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 I'll, as I'll discuss in more detail. So this pattern is surprising for a number of reasons. Um, one, applicatives like, uh, if this long suffix is an applicative, they don't usually, they shouldn't really add themes. And it's also unclear why this kind of applicative function would be restricted to a specific set of roots. Uh, which this function of the long suffix is. And as we will also see, this long suffix actually introduces different types 
of thematic roles depending on uh, the, the root. So we'll see with verbs of motion, we get quite a distinct type of uh, reading, uh, not uh, this theme reading, uh, which is also not something we expect from implicatives. Um, and the short suffix also has a strange behavior here because if anything, we would expect to find it with the 24AB examples. We don't expect it to be associated with a specific type of thematic argument, like a goal or path argument. Okay, so what's going on here? So as a point of departure, um, to, for the analysis I'm gonna motivate, I'm gonna look at verbs of motion, uh, which I will use to uh, argue that these verbs combine with a PP small clause. Um, um, and these verbs of motion make this particularly clear, I think, because they give rise to a sort of distinctive accompaniment interpretation that uh, I think is the most sort of striking of these um, effects. Okay, let me show you what that looks like. So we have a bunch of different verbs of motion uh, on this page. Um, I have some examples with uh, Ngalo and Ngasi, swim and crawl in 25. And as we, as you can see, there's this quite, uh, there's a twist on the pattern that we've seen so far with these. So the short suffix uh, behaves the same. It adds a goal or a path argument. So V with Ngalo uh, adds uh, a goal, I swam to the island. And V, v with Ngasi uh, adds a path, I crawled uh, the path. Uh, but when we look at the long suffix cases, we get a, a different reading. We don't get a theme reading. Um, Eroni, uh, so we get Koveroni uh, and Galovaka Nakoli. Eroni swam with the dog, where Vaki, this uh, long suffix, gives you um, this uh, accompaniment reading. Uh, or in 25D, uh, Vaki here gives you uh, crawl, I crawled with the child. Now, uh, it's important to note that this is not a committative reading. Uh, I'm referring to this reading as accompaniment because these examples describe very specific scenarios they uh, describe scenarios in which the agent is leading the object along in some sense. So uh, 25D refers to a scenario where maybe the child is on my back, for instance, and I crawl the child around, um, or a Actually, the scenario um, Irani, my consultant, offered is that he was sort of holding the dog afloat in a little basket. And apparently, he used to have to do that. That was his task when they swam from one island to the other. He had to hold the dog in the basket. So I have lots of Irani swimming with dogs examples because I always thought that was very, very cute. So this is quite a different reading from the commutative one. And as Schutz notes about this, he sort of points this out uh, as well in a, in a particularly clear way. The accompanying object never refers to another actor, but so something that can be carried. Uh, and again, these interpretations are, are quite productive across motion verbs. So you see in table two uh, that there are, is actually a fairly large range of different motion verbs, and they all have this pattern. You get variation in the consonant that goes with the suffixes, which I think is in line with the kind of allomorphy analysis I, I proposed. Uh, but you get this alternation between goal path and accompaniment consistently. Um, so what's going on with this accompaniment reading, which is uh, obviously uh, uh, looks less straightforward than the, than the theme. Um, literature on small clauses, you can add a um, It looks like our speaker is having some uh, connection issues. Small analyzed as a, a, sort of a, a small clause, the child around the garden where uh, the, ch the child is the figure of the preposition and the garden is, is the ground. Sorry, Papa. Um, um, no, yeah, my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me again? Yeah, yeah, you froze up a bunch of times. Um, okay, should I go back I think, over? I think, short, I think shortly after you switch to this slide. So I think if you could. Okay, I'll just start from the top. So ahead. yeah, so okay. what's actually particularly unusual about these motion verbs is that in many languages, motion verbs don't really combine with a direct object directly. So for English, it's well known that you can't say things like, I crawled the child, or Fatima swam the dog. Um, but uh, as noted in the literature on small clauses, um, it's 
it is possible to add an object to an English motion verb by adding a prepositional small clause. So you can say things like, I crawled the child around the garden or Fatima swam the dog to the shore where you're adding this prepositional phrase in which uh, the first TP is the figure of the preposition, the second is, is the ground. So this is often analyzed as a sort of prepositional phrase, a uh, small clause. And if we look at these kinds of examples like 27A and B, we notice that they actually have the same accompaniment uh, interpretation that we saw in the Fijian cases. If I uh, swim the dog to the shore, it's not necessarily, it's not really the case that the dog is just committedly swimming with me, I'm sort of leading them along in some way. If I crawl the child around the garden, I'm, I'm kind of doing the same thing. So I wanna take these kinds of examples as a model for what's going on with these uh, unusual verb classes in Fijian. And I wanna propose that Fijian motion verbs really have a similar structure. What looks like a transitive structure actually involves this uh, prepositional small clause and this long suffix re uh, reflects a preposition that incorporates into the verb. So what you're dealing with is not an applicative head, but a preposition that incorporates into the verb uh, and sort of in line with suggestions that applicative heads and prepositional heads have something in common fundamentally. So I propose to identify this long suffix with uh, this additional uh, prepositional structure. Um, so in this view, Akin all of its guises spells out an, an argument introducing head. So we can maintain a sort of unified analysis of this. Okay, so the structure is given so roughly for you in 28b, um, although there are some important issues to do with the thematic consonant that I'm gonna uh, skip over here. Uh, one piece of evidence that we wanna have this kind of complementation structure for these is that objects introduced by these consonant aki suffixes do incorporate. Unlike reason objects, you can incorporate them. So you can say something like 29a, Hironi swam with dogs, uh, where you actually get noun incorporation of this accompany, uh, accompaniment uh, object with the long, with also with the long suffix preserved, unlike the short suffix, which is not preserved in noun incorporation, inside of the incorporated noun. Um, and that, that we can explain that if this object is also in a complement position and you can get successive incorporation uh, into the preposition and then into the verb. Uh, and then you can get something like 29a. Um, and also the fact that these suffixes are, are preserved in noun incorporation surfacing inside of the incorporated noun provides evidence that they are, uh, they have this uh, argument introducing function. Um, we can also look, this also means that it's actually possible for this consonant aki suffix to co-occur with this reason taki, which is a different type of long suffix. So even though they look similar, I've put them in different places in the tree. And so that means it's actually possible for them to co-occur. And this is, uh, this is possible as long as you noun incorporate, because remember that usually you can't add more than one object to a clause because Fijian bans more than two objects. But if you incorporate one of them, then you can have both suffixes. So you can have something like 30, Nadava iko angalo vaki kolitaka, why did you swim with dogs? Where uh, you have both the uh, accompaniment suffix as well as this reason suffix, but they're on opposite sides of the incorporated noun showing you that they are in different positions in the verb phrase. Okay, uh, so that's my uh, proposal for uh, these accompaniment regions. So I'm gonna generalize this to other structures involving the same verbs. So I'm gonna adopt the same structure for verbs of motion with a short suffix, uh, but just without an overt realization of this small clause. So uh, where you get this goal path argument, I just wanna assume that they have the same structure as something like I swam to the shore as in English, but just with uh, no overt realization of this preposition so that you just get the uh, plain transitive spelled out. Um, so in this view, it's not the short suffix that adds the gold path argument, but it's this covert PP structure. Um, did I freeze again? No, okay. It said your internet connection is instable. All right, good. Um, so, and note that this small, these small clauses are usually only gonna add one object, unlike in English where you can add two, but that's also because of this distinctness requirement discussed in section uh, 4.2. So they're much more like something like, I walk, I swam the dog across or something like that, which you can also do in English where the prepositional small clause only adds one uh, argument. 
Uh, one prediction that comes out of this is that if you in now incorporate one of them, you might be able to get both. Uh, this doesn't seem to be very productive, but I have some examples where it does seem permitted, where with uh, where you can have noun incorporation as well as this accompaniment suffix uh, with the goal path and uh, goal slash path argument and the accompaniment argument. So that one of these examples is given in, in 31. Okay, uh, let me quickly move on to these theme uh, arguments. So there are two more, so I wanna basically extend this analysis to verbs that appear to take themes. And I wanna suggest that these also just have this kind of small clause structure. Uh, so there are two uh, relevant subclasses of verbs. They're verbs of ballistic motion, like throw and shoot, um, which we've seen before. There are also verbs of bodily emission, like uh, to vomit or to pee, um, which are in 33. Where, with all of these, uh, the short suffix gives you a goal path interpretation, and the long suffix gives you what looks like a theme. So I vomit up the, the taro, um, uh, the woman that I threw the ball, that kind of thing. Uh, so there's a full list of those verbs in table three. Uh, so the basic proposal here is, is in this box. I, pr I propose that these verbs also in combine with the same kinds of small clause structure. Um, uh, even though it looks like these are themes, uh, they're really not that different from uh, the accompaniment reading. Um, and let me take, I'll just take a little bit of extra time to explain this, but I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, so the basic idea here is really at the bottom of the page is that uh, these themes are really not as different from the accompaniment reading as they may seem. All three of these verb classes describe movement. When you throw or um, you spit or something like that, there's also a movement of some sort. And the theme in these cases also accompanies that movement. It's really also just an accompaniment reading. So uh, you, the ball travels along that trajectory as well. The only difference with these verbs of motion or emission is that the actor doesn't travel along that path. Um, yeah, we can talk about this more in the uh, question period if because uh, that was a bit quick. There's a little bit of evidence that these are not always straightforwardly themes from Icelandic here, which you can have a look at, but I'll skip for reasons of time. Um, and so I'll, I'll wrap up. So I've argued, I've presented a syntactic analysis of the property, properties of this short and long suffixes in Fijian, which I think may generalize to some other oceanic languages that have similar patterns. I argued for an analysis of thematic consonants as realizations of little v uh, in support of uh, analyses that take them to be independent morphemes. And I proposed an account of apparent departures from the sort of plain transitive and applicative functions of these heads by arguing that uh, these verbs combine with a small clause complement that permits some variations in its uh, argument structure. All right, thank you. All right, uh, let's thank our speaker. Um, so at this point, the chat should be open again. And uh, so I'm going to ask everyone, uh, if you have any questions, please indicate so in the chat and I will call on you. All right, uh, we have a question from Kenyon. Hey, thanks, this is cool. I had a question about the small clause analysis. Um, so one, one of the things that I think we know, at least in English, about small clause nominals is that they don't like to be prepositional. So you, I think it's quite strange, again, in English to say, um, look at that beautiful shore over there. Um, I don't know which dog to swim to it. Oh, no. Based on the example, based on the example that you gave earlier with the, you know, swim the dog to the shore. Right. I've yeah. replaced the, the nominal that's supposed to be a small clause nominal with a light preposition. And at least to me, and I think Mitchell as well, based on a conversation we had recently, it, it sounds a bit strange. So my question is, relating it back to your talk, do you know if there are restrictions on, similar restrictions on realizing the small clause arguments, the, the, the things that you analyze as, you know, small clause nominals introduced by a preposition in Fijian, are they subject to a similar restriction? 
I mean, they have to be objects for DB objects for sure. When you get these long suffixes, I'm not sure if I, I guess I'm not sure I quite understand your English example, to be honest. Uh, so, 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 so the English example is, re is replacing, you know, to the shore. Yeah. That's the, that's the small clause nominal. Yeah. It's replacing the noun within that with the pronoun. And it sounds oh, strange. Oh, like yeah. the nominal context is what you're exactly. saying. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think that, no, I don't think so. I mean, in fact, one of the ways in which I've sort of elicited these often is to just ask mm -hmm. for the plain verb form because with just the ah at the end, you, so, you know, like for, I've, I've gone through lots of lists of verbs and some of these verbs don't exist anymore or speakers don't recognize mm -hmm. them. And I often just ask, you know, can you say Louis Rada or something like that um, uh, in a air Louis Rada? Because Louis Rada in isolation just means that it actually means to vomit it out. Um, and uh, so, I, and I've never, I've not encountered. So I, I actually, one way I've often elicited these forms is as a baseline mm -hmm. with the pronominal ones. Um, so I'm I not in okay. kind of anti-pronominal. I think about that. It's a good, it's a good, it's a nice question. Great, thanks. All right. Um, we have a question from uh, Dan, Dan Brunkin. If you could unmute yourself. All right, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, so I, I have like a, a Part comment, part question. So the part, the, the comment part is that, so Indonesian has a suffix kan, uh, mm -hmm. which sort of does all, all of the things that you discuss here for the, right. an incorporated So it licenses transitive objects, benefactives, causatives, uh, and does all sorts of stuff. So, so maybe that would be worth looking into on this analysis. Um, and, oh, sorry, did that, did that come through? I think I, I think I got some bits of your question, but I think you just said look into Indonesian Khan, which is also clear. Actually, I'll say, um, could you? Because it has some of the same functions. Yeah, and maybe if you typed your question. I never know whether it's my connection or his connection. It's also I think it's his connection this time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I don't really, I'm not sure that I have, um, I have much to say about, deep to say about where the distinctness requirement comes from that's not something that Norvin's already said, I suppose. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I guess I think of it as sort of syntactic OCP. Um, and I'm also interested in the idea that uh, Michelle Yuan's developed that maybe dependent case, uh, well, I guess Norvins also suggests this connection, but maybe the dependent case could be a, a flip side of that. So I, I guess the way I think about it is that maybe there are syntactic OCP requirements and they vary in their severity across, um, across languages. Um, I think I, you wanna go a distinctness route with these. Uh, the, I, I sort of alluded to this, but one thing that's actually, you could also think about this in terms of case licensing, but actually when you add the reason applicative, so the idea would be there's, there's just not a third case licensor around, but actually when you add the reason applicative to a, an, an unaccusative, it's the unaccusative that gets subject agreement. Uh, so it seems to ignore the reason applicative, um, which you can make sense of if the reason applicative is, uh, inherently case licensed, because then you can ignore it, but not if it needs independent case licensing in a sort of straightforward way. So I don't think the case licensing approach kind of works. So that's why I want to think of it in this, this distinctness, distinctness kind of view, but yeah. I would want to relate it to the OCP, to sort of a general dispreference for two identical things in the same domain. Um, yeah. Yeah, and if you, yeah. uh, in the chat, he left a, a comment yeah. about, I think- Thank you, I definitely. Was, uh, I didn't know it. I knew it was cognate and that it has applicative functions, but I didn't know it was such a wide range of different functions. All right. Um, next, I'd like to call on uh, Lauren Clemens to ask a question. If you could unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Kopa. Um, so I was wondering, and I, I don't know if this came up. I kept trying to flip through your handout on your screen, yeah. which of course I can't do, but so the question is whether Fijian has a freestanding prepositional version of Taki and if it combines with like DPs like in UAN and if so, 
is it Taki or Aki? And if it doesn't, um, I was just wondering if you think this is an idiosyncratic difference between Fijian and Yuan. <clears throat> and if so, would there be a way to account for that? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I was idiosyncratic that. or meaningful. Um, yeah, what is meaningful is a good question. There aren't straightforward analogs. You don't get taki or aki as a as a preposition, although you get, I mean, yeah, there, there clearly, there are like, there's like an e that you get for some things, um, although it has kind of different functions. Um, and, you know, historically, you know, it doesn't seem unlikely that these come from prepositions in Fijian as well. Um, yeah, I don't know what, yeah, I'd have to think about that. I mean, so as so a further, remember the the Nui, in fact, aki can be prepositional, but also appear after the verb, right? With the verb instead. Mm -hmm. And you can even sometimes get both. I feel like I've read that you can get both at the same time, exceptionally. Oh, so, I, I'm not sure I've ever bumped into that. Maybe you've read it. I read a dissertation by somebody from Stanford. Yes, I think it was Doug Ball. Yeah, where he had this double aki pattern. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to think about why, why, why that would be. I hadn't really thought about it as a sort of, you know, something to explain. Yeah, I wonder if there's something there too, because it looks like the order um, on the verb may be different when you get, I mean, comparing Nguyen and Fijian, um, when you get more complex verb forms. But um, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll think about that. All right, um, and we have a question from Yining. You could unmute yourself. Thanks, Kopa. Um, so I had a question um, about, so in um, Achenese, um, when you do, so okay, so basically I wanted to ask if you have any um, examples of causatives of unergatives um, and what the interpretations of those causatives are. Uh, because in Achenese, um, Julie Leggett has shown that causes of unergatives are interpreted um, kind of in a special way. So when you make a child jump, you're kind of forcing the child to jump in your lap. It's the child isn't jumping on their own. So they don't have this kind of agentivity or volition. Um, so I'm wondering if your accompaniment, your associative um, applicative is kind of similar in that the dog can never swim on its own when it's in that complement position, whether it's in a mm -hmm. small clause or just a theme on its own. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that would be a really nice connection to make, however you end up analyzing either of those um, situations. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. And you, the causes on, on ergatives don't have that kind of interpretation in Fijian. Uh, you can have the sort of, the, you don't, it doesn't have to be, that's kind of associative reading. In fact, the causative of unergatives is sort of the prototypical causative because the causative of unaccusative is actually not very productive at all. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I hadn't thought about the sort of associative connection with regards to the um, long suffix with the uh, with the motion verbs in particular. Though so that's a good that's a good idea. I'll think about that. Thank you. Thank you for that's that's action. That's like Julie's work on actions. Yeah. Talk. So, like at 2014, has a few examples of this. Um, yeah. Oh, and since we're on this topic, I was just wondering where your causative head is um, and what it is. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I take it to be. I mean, it, it's it's kind of like the, what it has some of the ranges of functions that people have associated with the fixal causatives where there also seem to be some verbs where it looks like it's um, just transitivizing them. Uh, so I think you like an analysis of it as sort of little v sometimes, sometimes little v with its own voice head is kind of attractive, but obviously I'm identifying something else as little v. Um, so, and, and the causative does still come with its own um, with the, you still get the short suffix and uh, you get the, the final, the thematic consonant and the final E as well, the short suffix. Uh, there are even some interesting allomorphy patterns that are in the appendix that I think really show that uh, you want the thematic consonant to be separate uh, morpheme. Uh, so the way I was thinking about, I mean, the only way, I hadn't really thought about this very deeply um, but the way I was thinking about that is that it must maybe be the case that the 
sort of two functions that people associate with little v verbalizing and adding causative semantics for somehow being expressed by two different morphemes here uh, and that you want to split those up and then you can maintain that kind of a fixable analysis as well um, does that make sense yeah i mean you could imagine that the the causative could be like a, a light verb on its own or a little root on its own yeah yeah Thanks. yeah yeah, but it, yeah, so that's on, yeah, that, that's also that's also an, an idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, good question. All right, um, and then we have a question from Mitchell. Thank you. Th this is really neat, Kopa. Um, I also have a little V question, maybe. Um, so, if I understand, if I followed everything, so you have Taki where. T is the realization of little v tr that's forced by the apple head near it. And then you also have the other, you know, consonant ducky long affixes where, for example, you gave us a lot of bucky examples where the v is the short suffix, right? It's the thematic consonant. It's the thematic consonant, yeah. Um, and which is the little v yeah well okay. no also yeah so this is the i guess what you're asking so this i sort of put this in the i had this in the earlier version but then i put it in the footnotes because it was already getting too long and i thought it'd be too confusing but there is actually a really thorny issue with the uh with the diff, with the how these parts come together with the um in that's clear in Example 28 30. Or example 30, yeah. If you look at example 30, you have both yeah. a V and T seem to be realizing the thematic consonant. Yes. And so actually, um, it, there must be two sources of it. And I actually take this, uh, what I suggest in the paper is that the, the, the V um, associated with the accompaniment suffix, it can't be little V anyway, because if it is little V, it's not really in the right position after incorporation to begin with. Because uh, if you think about it, if you have this ak uh, or aki uh, incorporating into the root and then that moves up to little v, that's the wrong order of things. So um, you already have to say that the thematic consonant of these suffixes maybe actually has a prepositional origin. It's also another functional head in the prepositional domain, um, which is a little bit ugly, but then at least you have a second source for these I know a, a, little, a little bit, but the the V is idiosyncratic, right? I mean, it's the it's the one that depends on the root, as opposed to the T in Taki, which is always T, right? Well, it can, that can also vary with the with the root. I mean, not in this environment because you've disrupted adjacency, but uh, it can also vary with the root sometimes. Okay, I think I'm not. I think I'm. Maybe I'm missing something about the derivation of 30. I think that's what I was wondering about, but. Um. So yeah, I end up, actually end up having to say that for the long suffix where it's giving you this prepositional small clause structure, this thematic constant also has to come from inside of this PP, giving you two different places for these thematic constants. And the fact that, you know, in the usual case, I guess it will end up, it will still end up adjacent to the root, so it can still be conditioned by it. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a little ugly. It's a little tricky, um, and it might be. I mean, it might be one reason to like explore different ideas. But th that's that, that's, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Okay, um, and I think we have a little bit more time for one more question, and I see one from uh, Yuko Otska as a follow up. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, Kapa, thank you very much. It's very interesting. Um, I think it's, uh, my question is a little bit related to Mitchell's point. Um, if you treat this C um, not as a you know, realization of little V, but as part of the root, and then treat the allomorphy as a root allomorphy, that mm -hmm. might solve the uh, problem, right? And I, I, as I understand, it doesn't have to be in little v, right? You can, because you have to deal with allomorphy in various suffix conditions, right? And so the suffix changes 
well, little v changes according to which suffix or prefix attached to it, and and then it could be part of the root. So I was my question was, why do you need to really posit that this con consonant is a separate morpheme? Is is there really a need to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple of reasons um, from the allomorphy patterns in the beginning. So, I, yeah, so if you look at, it's a good, it's a good point. Uh, I should have more clearly addressed that kind of root allomorphy alternative. Uh, and it does, I mean, it does make more sense of that particular pattern that I was, that Micho was just picking up on. Um, one place where it might run into problems is the intensity suffix, for instance, it seems quite unsatisfactory to say that there's a, an allomorph of each root that ends in an L most of the time that's conditioned by the intensity suffix. Um, same thing for the reason one, I guess. I mean, you could, yeah, so, um, or some of well, the, but yes. You, sorry, but you could say that uh, when you have this particular suffix, you have to choose a particular form of the root. Can't you? say that instead of when you have this particular suffix you have to choose the particular form of little v yeah i think you, you know could just, yeah i think you could I, I, I think you just end up with a lot of different root alamars in some cases right. right but at the same time you have a lot of little v alamars right yeah but, but i think it is i mean I guess for the intensity suffix, right, the difference is between, do you, you have, you can have one rule that says little v is L before the intensity suffix, or you can have for every root, lots of different L final L words. It, it does seem like that's uglier to me. Mm -hmm. So I, there are some places where I think the root, where this analysis, I think has to posit far fewer rules than that kind of form than that kind of analysis where you're duplicating L words that look very similar across roots, and I don't think you ever you ever have to do that uh, on this analysis. Mm -hmm. But it's a good it's a good point. It's a good point. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>